the sidewalk was crowded the evening the kingfisher fell. People stopped, staring at the ground, then up, bewildered. It just dropped from the sky, a woman said. Above, Chittenden Bank rose shining four stories high. Windows are sky, dusky sky, the river meters away. Kingfisher, I know their chants by heart. I've watched hundreds dive, rise, fly off, but once I held a kingfisher in my hands. It may be the only time I touch that blue power. What I held was more precious than handfuls of money. If I could have thrown it, returned it to the wind, I would have. What to do with such wild pain was the question. And the answer, carry it across Elliott Street to the bushes by the church, to the flowers, and set it down. Slip it inside an envelope of green. Give it back. Give it back, all of it, and go home. Thank you all so much for having me here today, and thank you for being here. I want to welcome you trail walkers and stream dabblers, beach calmers, prairie gazers, guardians of prairie chickens and smooth green snakes, Marsh Speedwell, and Edith's Checker Spots. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to stand before you on this jubilant spring afternoon, um, honored as I am to uh, speak to you who care so deeply about the world, who carry its interests with you in wake and in sleep. Nature's plight uh, is dawning uh, on America, a reality that many of you have labored toward for decades. You were who were with Jimmy Carter when he lowered speed limits and installed solar panels on the roof of the White House, who were with E.O. Wilson when he said that poodles and lawns would not be enough to satisfy our biophilic yearning. You who were even with Rachel Carson when she said, only within the moment of time represented by the present century has one species acquired significant power to alter the nature of the world. Michael Pollan's piece uh, in the New York Times one Earth Day asked the question, why bother to do your part to save nature? The reasons not to bother are many, he wrote, but this afternoon I'm addressing the people who never, never asked that question, who knew that to bother was to set an example and to heal the split between what you think and do, and who never considered yourselves virtuous because you understand that acting benevolently was and is not a virtue, but a necessity and an ethic that serves as our moral North Star. I thank you. Not long ago, my son left home for college and I found myself writing a letter to him about life. The richest life I have found, I told him, is one that directly embraces nature. At times of greatest malcontent and dejection, I said the intricacies and genius of the natural world has comforted me. The human connection to landscape, of course, is even deeper, more vital. We are made literally of places, molecule by molecule, local water rushing through our veins, uh, minerals from a particular soil strengthening our bones, our identities, too, are formed from memories that are bound to place. One of the defining qualities of being human, I believe, is understanding our connection to the cycles of seasons, of moons, of weather, tides, and all the things that link us to the thousands of generations that came before us, before there were iPods or Blackberries or iPads or tablets. And to understand that we are dependent on the processes of the earth every minute of every hour of every day. We are biological creatures. Earth gives us light, life. Uh, when I see swaths of native landscape, I'm joyous. But over the years, I, in my 51 years, have seen from the air and the ground more and more fragmentation, more fields, more pavement, wider roads, more shopping malls, power lines, less forest. The world is a globe of leaf green continents amid five blue green oceans, land that we knife into smaller and smaller scraps. I'm forced to think about fragmentation because I come from a place where 99% of the native ecosystem is gone. 
93 million acres of longleaf pine flatwoods covered the southern uplands from, south, from Virginia to East Texas. But by 1995, um, almost all of that had vanished, replaced by pine plantations, clear cuts, Walmarts, suburbs, throwing an entire suite of adapted, specially adapted plants and animals like uh, Bachman sparrow, the red cockaded woodpecker, indigo snake, into uh, emergency. We've learned that ecosystem fragmentation affects negatively the abundance and persistence of wild species. Um, I want to tell you uh, that a, a very hopeful conservation story from the South most people don't know about. In 1988, the Nature Conservancy bought a little tract of land in a swamp in North Florida called Pinhook. Uh, the, the dream was to connect Okefenokee Swamp, which is 660 square miles of freshwater and uh, wildness in South Georgia, with the Osceola National Forest, uh, which is a vast pine land in sort of north central Florida. So after two decades of buying and buying and buying, uh, the Nature Conservancy finally completed the puzzle. They bought the last piece that uh, put it all in place. So now we have a tract of land, 750,000 acres in size, in size, land being re restored, which whooping cranes and Florida panthers can re-inhabit. What does it mean that we've preserved a territory of wildness straddling two states? Can it mean our great-grandchildren may hear a red wolf calling or a panther cry, two great sounds denied me? And it means more. What I've learned about fragmentation of the landscape is that it's mirrored in human society so that it, we, as we chop up ecosystems, we damage structures of cooperative human existence. Uh, this means marginalization of people, dysfunction, brokenness, divorce. Um, fragmentation in human society leads to isolation, just as with wild species. Uh, and isolation is the place of hopelessness, despair. But um, fragmentation is domestic violence, childhood sexual violence, an argument at a, at a family reunion. But the worst part of fragmentation is that it leads to annihilation, school shootings, war. When habitat is lost, species disappear. When human community is lost, we lose each other. So we know, hum we know community then to be a place of hope, possibility, wholeness. I believe that the most essential challenge before us in the, this 21st century is us figuring out individually and collectively how we're going to live so that we don't destroy ourselves, our communities, our atmospheres, the things we love. How are we going to lead sustainable lives, lives that make sense, return ourselves to wholeness? We may not have much time, and it may not be possible. I'm going to read a, a couple of poems as I do this little talk, and this one is about monarchs. Uh, I got to, I quit flying uh, six years ago now, but, and I came here by train, but I when I turned 40, I went to Mexico to see where the monarchs overwinter, and, and now the monarchs are in really sharp decline this year. Can the fire of monarchs be blown out? Millions of orange candles extinguished by wild snow and a fierce wind racing across the Mexican Sierra? Just like that, in one cold breath, could all the monarchs be gone? A butterfly's body is nothing but a notch of hollow reed glued to scraps of paper wings. Ardent and flammable, it was not made to last. One by one, the monarchs stiffen and drop from their gray masses to the forest floor, wings clamped, undressing the furs to the unexpected winter night. The question is, what would the world be like without monarchs' incandescence? without the knowledge scripted in the slender volumes of their leaves? Who would ring the bells of spring 
and the bells of fall in the bell towers along migration routes? Who would deliver messages of, of wildflowers and converse with ditch weeds, croon over stalks of milkweed, cradling rows of pearly eggs? And what, in a world without monarchs, would set love aflame? The return of wildness, our returning wholeness was made clear to me one afternoon in Alaska when I witnessed the release of a juvenile bald eagle. As a chick, it had fallen from its nest near Ketchikan. Its parents abandoned it to huddle on unforgiving rocks. And when rehabilitators attempted to replace it in the nest, they found the sh large snag so shaky they were afraid the whole business would come crashing down. So the chick was taken away and cared for by, by a vet wearing an eagle mask. It learned to fly in a mesh-covered flyway. The eagle's release happened quickly. A local shopkeeper who had provided chickens for feed was invited to do the honors. When he released the spring latch of the cage, the eagle bounded through the opening and for a full minute crouched dazed on the pebbly beach. Suddenly, the eagle beat its great wings and took to air as it had done time and again. This was its first flight in real open sky. It flapped, strong-winged, and wheeled out across the glittering bay, then rose higher and higher into an overcast sky until it was a small brown cross and then a memory. That evening, out of the blue, my, my husband said gratefully, Tonight, there's another bald eagle. Free in the world. Tonight, there's more love in the world. I've been asked a hundred times about my hope for the future. It's hope that enables us to live. Only hope, wrote uh, E.O. Wilson. The brain churns out narratives to make sense of life, scenarios of past, present, and future, real and imagined. Narratives projected into the future are all imaginary, of course. In the future, we find what is most distinctive about the human mind. While creating scenarios of the future, Wilson wrote, the mind also manufactures options, conceivable consequences, and whole new venues for narrative itself. Everything in life, he said, depends on how well the future is conceived. We are the future-seeking species. As I was thinking about hope, somebody asked it again, and I thought, hope. Finally, I thought this. I'd always tried to explain, well, I find hope in what nature's left. And, and then I thought, hope? Who needs hope? Why would you ask me about hope? Why is it important? Do you feed your child because you hope she'll turn out OK? And then you find out she has asthma or Crohn's disease, and so you stop? What about love? Why doesn't anybody, and I keep coming back to love, which is really what my talk is about, why doesn't anybody talk about love as motivation? So the question, how do you stay hopeful, is a, as ludicrous as how do you stay love-filled? How? I wake every morning and I watch that fat old orange sun rising over the pasture while wrens and great crested flycatchers call. But let me be honest, it's not hope, really, or love that keep me going. It's, it's fight, which I think is life force, which I think is love. What I want to really talk to you about today is what we can do. I always thought that I had this sort of three-point plan for saving the earth. If we could pass enough policy, save enough wild places, and educate enough of our young people, uh, we'd be OK. You know, we would end human ignorance and apathy. And then I began to realize that really it's the, the Industrial Revolution that causes us to destroy everything we love. 
our our rivers, our prairies, our black farmers, our white farmers, our indigenous peoples, free time, childhood, justice to other cultures, drinking water. And so for, for a long time, for many years, I never gave a talk unless I talked about industrial capitalism and how economically we were gonna have to, to, re, to revamp the way we do business so that we keep what we love. Um, I don't know anymore if that's the answer. Uh, but I'm, I'm gonna just, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna go through it very quickly and just tell you it's the only answer I have. Um, we have been sacrificing into this so-called free, global free market we've managed to spread industrial capitalism held in place by the military globally. We, we, um, we have been sacrificing into it the things that matter the most to us. We've been told that we're living this in, in this new economy that would grow endlessly. We've been told um, that our motto should be more, more, more. The model has been an uphill line. We gave corporations the rights of people. We gave them more access to government than we have. Capitalism promised prosperity to all the world, and we now know that it's limited to a small percentage of the world's population, and we in this room happen to be in that percentage, and it has accepted global collapse as the just the normal cost of doing business. So. Um, uh, many, many great economic scholars have told us that global industrial capitalism is going to fail because it requires more and more of itself to solve its own problems, and the earth cannot support more and more and more. Uh, we search for transformation then, especially with news of uh, climate change, climate catastrophe. So uh, there are five solutions there are five things to think about. One, we could keep going the way we're going and we will have to police natural resources worldwide. Uh, we will live with terrorism and catastrophe. We could imbue ethics back into this system, regulate more, pass more policies, punish polluters and insider traders and the people who murder labor organizers, uh, pass a rule that a bank loan has to stay where it originates and on and on. Uh, stop giving corporations more rights than people. I, I really liked what Bobby Kennedy once said about this. He said he, 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 there's a lot of great to capitalism. It, you know, it, it creates jobs. It uh, frowns on uh, inefficiency. Waste is inefficiency. However, he said, and I completely agree, corporations shouldn't be running our government. Three, we can change our accounting systems to figure in the true costs uh, of, on human health and the earth, the cost of doing business. Four, Herman Daly at the University of Maryland suggests coming up with a whole new economic system. Uh, when I always talk about this, people think that I'm communist, you know, and, and I, I'm not. Communism was a great experiment that has failed miserably. Um, capitalism is also failing miserably. Communism didn't produce enough for its people. They went hungry, and we're producing too much. We are violently, vulgarly wasteful. Uh, five is the one. So this new system could be, I think the model would be a straight line. Maybe we call it sustainableism. I don't know, but I love putting this idea out to young people because it's what we're going to have to think about. However, leaving all those four possible solutions or not solutions behind, the one my family focuses on is returning ourselves from a global, a global marketplace, a global economy, economy, back into local decentralized economies. So this is a spectrum, but let me just go through a few of these. I believe we have to get ourselves out of debt. I think we have to move towards solvency and figure out a way to put ourselves through college and our children through college without burying them in debt. I think we have to move toward right livelihood, this uh, inspirited idea of, of service, of mission. Move toward our friends, recreate communities, neighborhoods, families. Move toward conservation, sustainability. Uh, produce as much for ourselves as possible. Learn skills. I have an economist friend who, he, he himself was a gold and silver uh, 
derivatives investor. And he doesn't actually worry about money, but he, he gives talks at, at events we do in, in my part of the country, and he talks about what we should be investing in for the times to come. And one is you know, our own health, skills, tools. He, he also thinks alcohol, because you can trade alcohol when the crises, when the crises really hit. Gold and silver lots of dollar bills. Produce as much as you can for yourselves, learn to can, cook, grow, butcher, hunt, fish, plumb, survey, tinker, don't make fun of manual labor, domestic labor, no more farmer jokes. Beyond that, buy local, try not to shop at chains, give your money to your friends, not your enemies, and speaking of money, move toward doing with less. Um, move toward renewable energy, toward population control and reduce wants. Uh, Tom Powers, an economist in Montana, says that 89% of what we purchase meets desires. To address environmental destruction, we're gonna have to address campaign finance reform, lobbyist access to government, and rigged elections. Otherwise, democracy's in trouble, and where are we without a functional democracy? If we can stay entertained enough with golf and video games and thousands of channels to choose from and all the apps on our cell phones, distracted enough by swine flu, serial killers, terrorism, scared, we might not stand up and revolt against a system that rips away from us the things that matter in the core of our beings, yours and mine, and replace it with one that works. That means doggedly create, creating a life that puts the sanctity of creation first. When I was writing the seed book, I interviewed a, a very wonderful seed saver in Vermont named Sylvia DeVotts. She runs a little seed company, tiny, tiny, profoundly local company called Solstice Seeds. And she said, I see an activism. Now, I was introduced as an activist. I am undeniably, unforgivably an activist. I see in activism a kind of futility. The real action is in doing. The real action is in creating alternative systems that make the broken systems irrelevant. And I think that's why Gavin, when I, before I came up here, I think that's why he read that quote. That's where I've come to, that for my family, for my neighbors, for my place, my beloved place in South Georgia, for my people, my people of all colors, the, the Latin people in my community, the black people, the white people, that, we, that I begin to help them create, help all of us create a life that might get us through what's to come. We're going to have to fall in love with place, fall in love with each other, learn to stay put. Are we preparing ourselves for the world ahead? Are we preparing the world? And that's where you come in, you visionaries, you people of service, you people who came here today, you who can do so much good. Um, somewhat, somebody questioned Gandhi once saying, you know, our problems are huge. We need huge solutions. And Gandhi said, big problems need small solutions. Big problems need you doing what you're doing. At, at lunch today, I sat with a few women, strangers, and one told me that she walks around downtown Chicago during migration picking up migrant songbirds that have smashed into the tall buildings. She puts them in little brown sacks and takes them to a wildlife rehabilitator. Last week, uh, she found two ruby-crowned kinglets. Thank you. And let's be realistic. We need the training and the therapy that will help us work together without violence, that will open our hearts, help us heal, assist us in ending cycles and years of isolation. And we need our religions to uphold life, quit supporting war, and find peace. I'm going to skip a little section for time and say this. It's early morning, and I'm snorkeling in the Crystal River. 
Although the water is 72 degrees, the air is chilly, and to keep warm, I stay down. I'm wearing a mask floating at the edge of Three Sisters Springs. I'm here to see manatee, of which only 500 are left. In the light green water, I can't see more than 10 or 12 feet, so at first I'm frightened when two dim, monstrous shapes materialize out of the gloom. They're so big. They glide past close enough, I reach out and touch one. It turns, positioning itself alongside, rolls over and presents its belly. Its hide is rough and thick, covered with barnacles. I examine it before it slowly paddles on. Three others come, they go, five. Now, below, I can make out manatees resting on the river bottom in deep silt, sometimes atop each other, a fat knot of sea cows. The scene is surreal, the suddenness of a shape many times bigger than myself appearing out of the translucence. I start to become manatee. I wave my feet and glide, looking around at this water kingdom. The sun is in the sky. I glide and roll. I quit using my hands, and when a manatee, com manatee comes, I lay my goggled head against its side. A mother and calf dispatch from the group. The calf, curious, quits nursing when he sees me. He swims and tumbles and looks me in the eyes, and I roll with him, breathing when I reach the surface. The mother rubs her body against mine and rolls again and again. And then she puts her face with its searching eyes next to mine, looking deep within all the unknown. There is this attempt to enter another plane which is wordless and weightless, fluid, a beautiful lightness. Her eye is a wrinkled spiral, beseeching, and then I hear her speak to me. You must help us, she said. You must help us. Something rises in me that's been rising for a long time. I hear her distinctly. You must help us. We're desperate for thinkers. Not consumers were desperate for people of courage, people willing to take responsibility for their own actions, willing to live in service to something bigger than their own desires. It seems fitting that creatures of privilege, gifted beings, able to use language to pass messages across geographies and generations should speak and act on behalf of those who cannot. Because life is unendingly fascinating, unbearably beautiful, and utterly fragile. Thank you.